Hello, my name is Jack Ashby and today I'm going to be talking about two topics that really interest me. One of those is the mammals of Australia and the other is how museums go about representing nature. And I'm going to bring those together on the topic of decolonisation. Now obviously decolonisation is all about breaking down systemic hierarchies where European narratives have typically been considered superior really to any others. Um, for good reason, decolonisation work in museums is most commonly applied to human stories uh, where we can show how a colonised people's contributions have been sidelined in order to elevate European achievements, or when we go about exploring the ways that museum collections were put together as a product of empire. However, today I'll be talking about something slightly different, and that's how European colonial narratives are also present in how we typically talk about some animals today. Specifically, that Australian wildlife is regularly denigrated through hierarchical language, and that museums are complicit in this. So I'd like to ask you, are these phrases on the screen right now familiar to you in descriptions of Australian animals? I think when I talk to people about the wonders of platypuses, people will say to me, oh, that's so strange, in an excited way. Don't get me wrong, I think people are very, very fond of platypuses, echidnas, possums, koalas, wombats, uh, and all these wonderful creatures. But I do think it's really, really usual to see weird and wonderful thrown out of the descriptions of animals being bizarre or peculiar. And also, in a slightly different way, um, we see platypus and echidnas particularly, but also marsupials described as primitive. And I'm going to unpick all of these, but essentially my argument is that whilst these aren't necessarily negative in their own right, they are value judgments. And they're value judgments, I think, hark back to a colonial mindset from the very, very earliest European descriptions of Australia. Um, the whole result of this is that the subconscious view of Australia is that it's an evolutionary backwater, that it's a country full of wonderful but, but ultimately curious and odd uh, little peculiar creatures. And I'm going to go on to talk about what the impacts of that is. But arguably no wildlife in any other major landmass in the world gets con consistently described in this way. I personally think that Australian animals are scientifically speaking the best animals in the world. Um, and I, and I, I think that generally people are very, very uh, fond of them. They hold them with great affection. People are, adore platypuses, echidnas, wombats, koalas, etc. Um, but that doesn't stop these tro tropes being rolled out. They're considered fondly, but not fairly. So let's just unpick them. Uh, so on the screen here, if you can read them, are uh, two of our, of our country's greatest um, windows onto the natural world, the BBC and the Natural History Museum, and I don't mean to unpick them, uh, to pick on them unfairly, um, but these are relatively typical, one of which is describing Australia as, as marooned, weird and wonderful wildlife, and um, uh, the other talking about platypuses um, as peculiar. Now, I would say that literally every animal on earth is weird or peculiar. Um, deer, ants, bees, rhinos, bears, every animal is strange. Um, why is it that Australian animals get this label more than others? It's really common in museums, both in live content and written interpretation, to, to run out this weird and wonderful trope. It's used, obviously, as it sounds engaging, but I believe it is grounded in a subconscious colonial framing. It's just another way of othering these animals. It's been done since the very, very first um, written descriptions by Europeans um, throughout time. Uh, of Australian animals. In, in the 1790s, Watkin Tench was the diarist of the first fleet, European settlers, British settlers, uh, invaders uh, in Australia, wrote that kangaroo reproduction was contrary to the general laws of nature. Um, how an animal can be unnatural, I don't know, but it's, it's um, this language used to describe marsupials is essentially an element of the colonial framework. Western animals have acted as the zoological standard and Australian creatures, in not being perceived as conforming to that standard, have been implied as inferior to it. <laughs> Very commonly in museums also we see the word primitive thrown around, particularly for platypuses and echidnas, egg-laying mammals, um, but also marsupials too. So I don't again mean to pick on the field museum where this photo was taken, but this is their display of quote early mammals. Um, that's what the sign up the top says. On the left is the living uh, monotremes, the platypuses and echidnas. On the right is the marsupials. Now, 
All of these are living species. Each of these species is only a couple of million years old, which is the same age as pretty much every placental mammal. None of these species are older than the average placental mammal. It is not true to say that they are early mammals. Sure, the ancestors of monotremes, the ancestors of, of living platypus and echidnas have been around for longer uh, than other mammals. The ancestors of living marsupials are exactly the same age as, as living placentals. This is unfair. Um, describing platypuses as primitive, which is very common, and echidnas as primitive, uh, is probably because they have features that they inherited from their reptilian ancestors. Laying eggs is a feature they inherited from reptiles, um, from reptile-like animals um, that they evolved from. However, birds also inherited egg laying from their reptilian ancestors. So why aren't birds described as primitive? Having legs is primitive because we evolved it from our fishy ancestors. But we aren't considered primitive for having legs. This is just a human-centered uh, value judgment. Again, it's completely meaningless. And not just features, but no, obviously no living species can be considered primitive. Um, all living complex animals are equally evolved. Um, so I think this, this label of primitive is, is just another one of these colonial undertones. Very commonly when we describe uh, Australian animals, particularly marsupials, we describe them in relation to how they compare to well-known placental mammals. This is a quoll. Uh, it's a carnivorous relative of Tasmanian devil, another marsupial. Um, it's commonly described as cat-like, despite the fact that, in my opinion, shares very, very few uh, features with a cat. It's got long face, very short legs, not at all cat-like. It's really common for Australian animals to be described in this way. Dog-like thylacines, um, mouse-like antichinases and dunnarts, where none of these descriptions very, very often very rarely fit, um, fit the natural history. And I would say that constantly describing Australian mammals in terms of how they resemble mammals from the rest of the world could be argued to place them as secondary to them, effectively denying the Australian animals an identity in their own right. Again, I understand why this is done, it's why it's a useful trait um, to say, to help describe what they look like, but I, I think we need to think about whether where this places the animals in our On a similar topic, we talk about convergent evolution in museums. This is when the same features evolve in, in relatively uh, uncloosely related animals um, to fulfill the same roles. So this is a very, very famous animal. It's an II, a woodpecking primate from Madagascar, species of lemur. Its famous features are having a long middle finger for hooking out beetle grubs from holes that it bites with its long incisors in trees, tree branches. Very, very famous, but far less famous is the striped possum, which is a marsupial which does the same thing. It's got a very, very long middle finger. It's got very sharp incisors for gouging out holes uh, to hook those beetles with its fingers. We can talk about why I eyes are famous and why striped possums aren't uh, another day, but what I want to talk about is the direction of the language we use. So when placentals and marsupials have evolved similar features, we say that, for example, I, uh, that striped possums are marsupial versions of eye eyes. We say that thylacines are marsupial versions of wolves. We say that uh, Tasmanian devils are marsupial versions of hyenas. That implies that marsupials have evolved in order to be like placental mammals, uh, that one is the original and one is the cover version. That's not how evolution works. And in the same as in music, um, the cover version is never considered uh, as good as the original. And again, I think this, this implies a hierarchy that just isn't there. So why is this important? Why should we care about this? Platypuses are weird. Um, should I just get over it? I would say that all of the language that we see get, uh, get pervasively used that implies subconsciously or in positive seeming ways implies that Australian animals are inferior has inevitably, must have uh, inevitably um, impacted their extinction and conservation. So Australia is the worst place on earth to be a mammal. It has the worst extinction rate of anywhere in the world. In the, in the 222 years since the invasion of Australia by Europeans, more mammals have gone extinct in Australia than anywhere else. 35% of all mammals um, since that time, of all mammal extinctions since the time are in Australia. That's 10% of the entire mammalian fauna of Australia has disappeared since 1788. And I argue that 
this is an inevitable consequence of the way we think about them. If we describe them or encourage people to think of them as nothing but weird little oddities, little evolutionary curiosities, then it's going to be very hard to argue for their conservation. They just seem as not very important, or worse, that their extinction is inevitable because of their inferiority. Another impact of all of this, and it, 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 it ties in with another story I'm going to tell, is the impact on the people of Australia. Now, since European invasion, I use the word invasion rather than settlement. Settlement is the word we commonly use, and it implies you know, something gentle like settling snow. But it was not, the, the invasion of Australia was not a gentle process. Many thousands of people died. Um, since, the, since the invasion, not only have species gone extinct, and many species gone extinct, um, but it has fundamentally changed Aboriginal Australian people's relationship um, of their country. And the invasion was justified through the notion of terra nullius. That means nobody's land. Um, the, argue, the colonial establishment argued that Australian Aboriginal people were too uncivilised to um, make, lay legal claim to their land. They did not own it. They were nothing but um, primitive hunter-gatherers um, just moving across the land but not managing it. Now, there's that word again, primitive. I would say that the argument or the notion that Australian animals are primitive, which we see through pretty much every written description from 1770 onwards, um, every, every hint that they were inferior, that they were just odd curiosities, that they weren't as good as the rest of the world, helped justify um, the notion that Australia was uncivilised. And that, in that way, Australian animals and Australian people uh, then their fates have been tied together and their histories have been tied together um, by suggesting that not only were the people inferior, but also the animals. Um, Europeans can just could justify their claim on the land that in, in some ways um, they, they made the argument that, that the arrival of European animals and people was an improvement for us. Now in these two books, um, which I strongly recommend, Bruce Prasco and Bill Gamage, um, they make the arguments that Australian people were not hunter-gatherers at the time of European invasion. That, they, that the early settlers um, described complex agricultural systems. They described the use of crops. They described land management in ways that no one has been able to replicate um, in Australia to any effect since um, the dispossession of, of many Australian Aboriginal people. And so it was simply not true to say that they're hunter-gatherers. And also in museums today, we should avoid using the word hunter-gatherers. Um, and, and as I say, this, this just ties together the notion of, of how we describe animals today with how Australia is considered um, and its kind of level of, of civilization. So what does this mean for museums? Um, there are some very specific things that I'm saying, like avoiding words like primitive um, for describing any of Australia's animals or really any other animals whatsoever. Um, or avoiding using words like nomadic hunter-gatherers for Indigenous Australians. But there are also just general ways of thinking about these animals. Uh, is the language we're using going to imply a hierarchy? Is saying something is weird and wonderful or strange or peculiar uh, going to imply that they are just evolutionary oddities, the curious things that are fun to look at but ultimately are, are less valuable than animals from the other parts of the world? I think I just ask that people consider that when writing labels and coming up with engagement activities, tools and tweaks and things like that. And just to end on a little teaser, um, I also think Australian animals are the worst represented group of animals in museum specimens in the, from, uh, compared to any other part of the world. But they are more inaccurate than any other group of specimens. So as an example, I always use the echidna on the left from the wonderful Grant Museum has its feet, but all of its feet pointing in the wrong direction, held wrongly, its bellies on the floor. Uh, the one on the right from the Tasmanian Museum in Hobart uh, is the correct shape of an echidna. So when people come to our museums, they're seeing animals that don't look like the real thing. And that for Australian animals, I would argue that museums are the place that they are most likely to meet these museums. There are these animals. They aren't very often in natural history documentaries uh, and they don't see them in the wild or in zoos. So we are often teaching people the wrong thing. We should think about that too. Um, if you're keen on all of this, this is something I've worked up into a book that will hopefully be coming out next year or possibly 2022 in HarperCollins and University of Chicago Press. Um, I'll end there. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Jack. That was a brilliant talk and you definitely win the prize for the cutest animals uh, and look forward to the book. Uh, so we've got a question posted on the Q&A, so if you wouldn't mind having a go at answering that. When we work with the interpretation of these animals, we struggle tremendously because even if we are careful with our wording, the visitors are very much primed to read it as primitiveness. How can we best deal with this pre-existing misconception? Does debunking in text work when visitors will retain a minimal part of what they read? Um, it's a good question. I think a, we, could either, yeah, we could either tackle it head on and, and say when there are really, really common tropes. So yeah, when, when we write about platypuses and echidnas, we could we literally say in the interpretation, people often say they're primitive, but actually this is why they're not. Or, and I think that would work well. I think um, another approach just could be to, to talk about their wonder, to, to wonderfulness, like to approach them like we would any other animal. You know, when we're writing a label, it's what is the most important thing to know about this species in natural history. And for platypuses and echidnas, or any other animal, there's really easy ways to answer that. You know, this is, this is one of the only electroreceptive mammals on Earth. This is one of the only venomous mammals on Earth. And those aren't products of them being primitive, they've either, well, necessarily anyway, they're, yeah, they're amazing things. And it's just, can we go about a way of, of changing the, you know, the assumption and just say, this is an incredible species. And um, sure, we might need to mention their legs, because that is really, really interesting, but we could quite easily say the other wonderful things that they've evolved in the 70 million years since they split from everything else. Yeah, I think it's, it's good. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. And always a good place to start celebrating how amazing the natural world is. So you can't really go far wrong with that. I think we'd better leave it there because time's moving on. But thank you so much, Jack. And we'll move on to the next talk. <laughs>